Welcome to Citizens Climate Radio. In this show, we highlight people's stories. We celebrate your successes, and together we share strategies for talking about climate change. I'm your host, Peterson Toscano. Welcome to Episode 63 of Citizens Climate Radio, a project of Citizens Climate Education. This episode is airing on Friday, August 27th, 2021. Later in the show, you will hear good news out of the U.S. state of Utah. A group of Republican members of Congress have spoken out about the need to address climate change. And in the art house, well, actually, most of today's show is the art house. We're going to take a deep dive into arts and climate change. You will meet Claude Schreier, the host of the Conscient Podcast, Claude is a master sound designer, so he can take a standard interview about art and climate change and morph it into a piece of art. But first, let's go to the theater. To be in a space with live theater, something magical happens. And this is why I love climate change theater action. It places well-scripted short plays about climate change into the hands of everyday people who may have never done theater in their lives. With a script and a role, the players dive into new worlds. Chantal Bilodeau, a Canadian-born playwright, along with other colleagues, developed the idea. In 2015, four of us came together and created Climate Change Theater Action. We felt like there needed to be more stories told about the climate. The concept of a, of a theater action already existed. It was something that Kerdad Zvit founded some years ago, asking playwrights to write short script around a social issue and then mobilizing the theater community to present these scripts in different location. So we took that concept. In 2015, we adapted it a little bit. And then since then, it has grown. We commissioned 50 playwrights from around the world to make sure that all the inhabited continents are represented. And we asked them to write a five-minute play based on a prompt that deals with an aspect of the climate crisis. So, for example, in 2021, the prompt is envisioning a global Green New Deal. So we end up with this collection of 50 plays. We make the collection available to anyone who wants to organize an event in their community within a a time window that is in the fall. So again, in 2021, it's between September 19th and December 18th. And anybody can present one or several of the plays. It's up to them. They can add more material on their own if they want to. This presentation can be just about anything. It can be as small as a reading, you know, in somebody's backyard with a few friends or as big as a fully produced show on a stage somewhere. In a climate movement that often struggles to bring in a diversity of voices, Climate Change Theater Action includes a wide array of playwrights from around the world. Canada, the U.S., the U.K., France, Brazil, somebody from Korea someone from Hong Kong, a few from India. It's pretty much all over. And of course, someone from South Africa, which is you. Hosting a climate change theater action event can be such an excellent way to open up a discussion about climate change while bringing people together in the community. Some CCL chapters have used their monthly meeting time to read some of the plays. Other groups have held public events where they partner with a local theater ensemble or students studying acting. But you may be wondering, yeah, but what does it cost? It can be zero dollars, and a lot of people do it with no money. You can just pick up a script and read it. Or you, if you have funding or if you have a budget, then you can put something, create something bigger. But it's really up to every individual. The writers are commissioned to write the plays, and the commission takes into consideration the fact that they've agreed that these plays would be presented with no additional fees being charged during this time window. But what if you are a group of people with absolutely no experience in theater or the arts? That's a great question. Sometimes people who are not in the arts or not in the theater will just pick up a play and read it as part of a meeting. For example, we have faith communities who have participated or environmental organization, and they pick up a play and they read it to each other. 
or if they have a meeting you know with a large group of people they might use one of the plays as an opener to the meeting or to illustrate something they're talking about it doesn't have to be performative in the way that you know you you need to have experts put on the play it can be just anybody reading it as part of a bigger event to find out more people can go to our website which is climatechangetheateraction.com and theater is spelled r e not e r on the website it lists what is expected from collaborators it's it's very simple essentially they have to present at least one play from the collection in between the dates that i mentioned september and december 2021 and then they email us we send them the plays they can read through the collection and then they choose something they like once they've made their choice we then just ask them for information about what they're going to do so we can keep track and help publicize it And if you're in Canada, you can even get some funding to put towards your event. Canada Council for the Arts and we're able to offer micro grants to Canadian artists who want to put up an event and these micro grants are just uh, especially to help either individuals or small groups who wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. It's the first time we're able to do this this year, but we're hoping that additional funding as the project continue to evolve would be able to do it. for more countries or to open it at large but there's any canadians listening again go to the website climatechangetheateraction.com and there's some information about how to apply for the micro grant what makes this year's climate change theater action especially meaningful is that most of the plays consider what success will look like they envision a livable world of possibilities for climate advocates it is essential to hold on to these types of visions They reveal what we are fighting for. Chantal put me in touch with another climate change theater action playwright based in Cambridge, England. Zoe Svensson. Oh, well, I say I make theater. Although actually over over time that sort of the definition of what theater might be kind of bleeds out into video installations, multiple conversations and make work that's very much about participation but not just for the sake of it but more to set up conversations and open up different kinds of spaces for experiencing the aesthetic. I didn't become interested in the climate crisis particularly because of a background in environmentalism or activism around that kind of thing or or um e- even a personal sort of deep engagement with nature. I mean that's actually changed. In fact it took the pandemic in a way like I think for many people for that to change for me. But I am really interested in like Why as humans we screw our lives up so badly? <laughs> so when I, when I found out about what climate change was doing, and particularly about the two degree tipping point, I was just like, what? Like, are we crazy? <laughs> like, are we, are we just totally you know, our way of life. I mean, when I say our, I mean you know mine and the Western culture. Zoe's short play, Love Out of Ruins, is unique among the fifty plays in that she invites the players to individualize the script. It's a kind of life project called Love Letters to a Livable Future. Each of these pieces of work has kind of been thinking about how we imagine the world that we could be in if these extraordinary, brilliant ideas that are out there for transformation actually really happened. Because often you hear about these amazing visions and it sounds great, but you can't quite imagine yourself in it. And we were thinking, well, what would it be actually like if we we lived in cultures of planetary flourishing? when we come to imagining possibilities and imagining alternative futures it's really important that there's not a single utopia that there's you know i think often that one person's utopia becomes someone else's dystopia really really quickly and so this sort of feeling was it needs to be a kind of multiplicity that there's lots of different ways of imagining and that those imaginings are specific to particular places and cultures and networks and friendships and you know relationships you know but they also have kind of affinities across different geographies and cultures and 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 different ways of living so it's about sort of thinking about affinities and overlap rather than there is one way to produce a future and i suppose that it's embedded in the sort of idea that a group of people might take this this skeleton effectively and like make it their own i recently met with a group of young climate advocates online I invited them to consider a world without fossil fuel pollution. Some of them confessed they couldn't do it. 
They think about the future and it all looks horrific in their minds. We're trained by disaster movies to see that sort of apocalyptic scenario. And of course, it's not to downplay the fact that actually in many parts of the world, the climate apocalypse is already upon us. But that actually you can also see all the extraordinary things that people are doing to change and mitigate and do that. And we thought, well, if we stay in that space, if we try and concentrate on that, then maybe we can help, we can add to the sort of attention that people pay to that. And then once that starts to become more part of people's sense of that's what everyday life is, the more possible things become. And you can kind of build on that in a networked, you know, very small scale networked way. The activation of the imagination makes things seem possible and then people do stuff and it doesn't seem like such a big deal. There's um, brilliant work done in family therapy around the idea of active hope and the notion that hope is a verb. And I love this image that it's not that you have hope because that sort of can lead to despair when you look at the reality of what's around us. Um, but instead hope is what happens when you do have a series of small actions that you can engage with that start to make a change or a difference or can network into changes that are being made more broadly. And that sort of sense of it being an active process rather than a, a thing, rather than a sort of experience, feels really powerful. To help us engage our imagination, Zoe has created a play where we get to decide many of the details in it. Think of it as a much more sophisticated version of Mad Libs, with the aim to create a vision of the future worth pursuing. So this is potentially a multiple voice piece, but it could be a monologue. And then a lot of it has to be decided by the people who are involved in it. The play begins in the present time and moves forward. You get to decide the details that shape the character's world. You were born this year. You live in, brackets, name a place you know. It is late, name a season. It is early morning. It is now, brackets, warmer, colder, wetter, drier, or this time of year than it used to be. Then the play jumps slightly ahead in time. You are eight years old and you're running down your street, slaloming between bikes and elders, sitting out and newly planted brackets, name of type of tree, resilient to the future, consider its purpose, fruit, shade, close brackets. You're late for school, which today is at the brackets, name an unlikely but brilliant site for teaching kids by example, rather than in a classroom. For example, in a library for literacy or even a publishing house, in a bank for maths or a grocery store, a fashion house for drawing, a farm for biology or ecology. Anywhere that's supported by teachers, workers might share their specialism in an educationally relevant way. Close brackets. So that would be, you know, that's a long description, but in, in, the, in the performance, it would probably be a few words, you know, at the bank, where you're learning about maths, for example. You're 22 years old and preoccupied. You turn the corner onto name a relevant residential street. So that's when it sort of gets localised. And I won't carry on, but you can see that it, it jumps from age to age across somebody's life and then invites the people making it to imagine very specific elements within that that make it their own. This sort of structure helps us so much in disciplining our minds to actively consider a livable world. The play provides a framework that stirs up imagination and even enthusiasm for the future. And also it's hard, I think, at the moment because like the worst case scenarios keep happening. So it's more and more effort to keep holding this space of imagining and, and, and opening. Yeah, opening yourself. It's kind of vulnerable, makes you vulnerable to opening yourself to the future in a positive way, I think. You can read Love Out of Ruins by Zoe Svensson at one of your events. In fact, having a group of friends, students, or climate advocates sit and fill in the lines can be a mind and heart expanding activity. Then you can share the results at a climate change theater action event you host and read some of the plays by the 49 other playwrights from around the world. Learn more about how you can get your hands on these plays and host your own event. Visit climatechangetheateraction.com. That's climatechangetheateraction.com.
As a podcaster and producer, I listen to many other programs that teach me about climate change. Every now and then, though, I hear something that does more than just inform and educate me. A well-designed podcast hits me in the heart and the gut. It becomes a transformative audio experience. This is exactly what happened when I first listened to Claude Schreier's Conscient Podcast. As a sound designer, he is able to reach deep into a listener's mind and even our bodies. Sound has that power. I chatted with him about his podcast and his own journey as an artist addressing climate change. From that recorded conversation, Claude created the following audio treatment. I encourage you to listen with headphones on. Welcome to the Conscient Podcast. My name is Claude Schreier. I live in Ottawa, and I was born in Ottawa, though I lived in many other places, but uh, Ottawa, the capital of Canada. Well, I used to say I'm a cultural bureaucrat, but now I say I'm an independent cultural worker. When I was a bureaucrat, I worked in the arts as a funder, but uh, I've always been an artist, and I consider myself a cultural worker as much as an artist because that's essentially what artists do. And I, I have different, I play different roles. I, I do podcasts, I create work, I, I facilitate. So cultural work is like a, a good generic term. Season one of the Conscient Podcast was about exploring how the arts contribute to environmental awareness and action. Well, I consider myself a student of Zen. I uh, have a daily practice in a monastery here in Ottawa, so that's a big part of my life. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a community person, uh, different identities. I, I guess the, the sound artist one is also important because it's been with me all my life, creating uh, soundscape work and music. And Season two is about accepting reality, working through ecological grief, and charting a path forward. And I, all those identities get layered, and I, I don't, never put them in a hierarchy, but they always feed off of each other, and, you know, family, art, culture, those kinds of things are important to me. And why did you decide to create this podcast? That's a good question. It goes back to a conversation I had with my then 17-year-old daughter who uh, wanted to know, have my advice on what to study at university. And I said, well, you can study whatever you want. She said, yeah, but we have a climate crisis, if not emergency. Uh, what should I do? And I said, well, it's do what you want. <laughs> but that, that was a trigger for me to, to get more involved in the art and climate movement as a cultural worker and to use the skills I have as an audio artist. So I, I decided to start a podcast. I wrote a, a first piece called Terrified. That in May 2019, my climate denial bubble burst. It was a terrifying and disorienting experience that made me question everything about my life. In retrospect, I realize this was a Zen-like gift of terrified awakening, of clear seeing. But at the same time, I felt paralyzed with emotion and dread.
that was my first season of, of conversations, and now I'm into the second uh, around the theme of reality. But uh, I enjoy audio and um, and conversing with people and also using uh, my, my practice as a soundscape artist to combine uh, writing uh, or composing uh, art, art uh, sound art, with a, a type of journalism uh, similar to what you do, uh, talking to people about the, the issues, but in a conversational way. And sometimes it gets mixed in with art and it kind of takes the listener to the here or to there more and more i now see and more importantly i now feel in my bones the state of things as they actually exist without social filters or unsustainable stories. Because a lot of a lot of information is is uh, transmitted through soundscapes, through uh, field recordings, as opposed to ideas and words. And I, I learned that in Zen Buddhism that our thoughts are not as important as we think they are, but what we experience, what we feel, what we uh, what we actually uh, uh, the sensations that we we have in in day to day life are really our lives, as opposed to only our thoughts. And from. The start of this podcast, the first season, and now in the second season, what have you learned about climate change, and what have you learned about yourself? Well, it was it's really all about a, a learning journey, and so it's been tremendously helpful. I, I've tried to talk to as many different people as possible. Um, I've learned a lot of technical information, um, and uh, doing this reality piece, I, I've tried to uh, talk to people that uh, I don't know or I, uh, that I need to know more about their work. So about, for instance, echo grief, I know a lot more. I, I've had um, exchanges with Jennifer Atkinson in the US and, and other experts who have been really helpful. Environmental Humanities Professor Jennifer Atkinson. Echo anxiety and climate grief are sometimes framed as disorders. But in fact, these feelings typically arise from an accurate perception of our ecological crisis. It may be more appropriate to identify echo anxiety as a moral emotion, a sign of compassion, attachment to life, and desire for justice. And then I share it. So uh, it's it's a way of learning. And then that learning kind of multiplies as people learn from me and I learn from them. And, and then eventually we start doing projects together because it's not just about thinking. It's about uh, deciding how to move forward. Uh, from my base in the arts, uh, I, I feel there's a lot that more that artists can do. Uh, they're doing a lot, but uh, so it's been that kind of. Uh, and when I, when I'm done, I don't know when I'll be done. But when I feel I've learned a lot and I want to do other things, then I'll, I'll probably just stop and do something else. But for now, it's very nourishing. How is your podcast different from other climate podcasts? Well, not necessarily trying to be different, but it is because it's bilingual. Donc, une partie de, de, du podcast ou du balado est en français. Bienvenue à Conscient. Mon nom est Claude Schreier. And, and I purposely, because I'm a bilingual person, uh, have uh, I don't have two channels. I have the one channel. And so the, the podcast is called uh, Conscient Podcast slash Balado Conscient. So some of the episodes are in French, some are in English, and that kind of widens the range of people I can reach. And the other characteristic, I think, is uh, is my integration of, uh, of field recordings as a as a as a voice uh, in in the uh, in the editing. I don't know how 
original that is, but that's that's what I want to do is is have the freedom to to really do the podcast the way I I would like to listen to sound and to to radio. If I was driving, what would I want to hear? And I, I like a lot of silence. Definitely check out Claude's bio on his website. He shares his life, work, and thought journey with written word and recorded sound. The website is conscient. .ca. That's conscient.ca. If you have an idea for the art house, feel free to contact me, radio at citizensclimate.org. Our good news story this month comes from the U.S. state of Utah. I'm Tom Moyer. I'm the state coordinator in Utah. We recently helped coordinate an op-ed authored by 25 Utah Republicans supporting fee and dividend. 19 of those are, are currently sitting state legislators, four are former state legislators, and two are former gubernatorial candidates. We want meaningful climate policy to come from both sides of the aisle. We want this to be bipartisan, we want it to be durable, and we feel like a carbon fee and dividend really fits in with conservative values and can come from people in the Republican Party following their values. We wanted to craft a message that Republicans could happily sign on to emphasizing values of individual responsibility and accountability and downplaying the climate crisis and focusing more on reducing emissions, improving air quality, and leaving the decision-making in the hands of private sector and individuals, taking government out of the decision-making. We feel like fee and dividend is a great approach for that. I had no expectation of getting 25. I had no expectation of getting a dozen. I thought maybe we can get three or four if we really, really put our backs into it. And I will tell you that Utah is overwhelmingly Republican. Anything that happens in this state happens with the approval of the Republican Party. We worked on the couple of supporters we had and then we went out and beat the bushes and tried to get them some friends. In the beginning, it was long, slow going just to get another and lots of introductions and explanations and people being unwilling to step out. And then finally, we got a couple and it started to snowball. They started talking to their friends and we were getting yeses at a rate of several a day. We ended up getting some fairly influential signers who go far beyond our sort of usual expectation of environmental Republican moderates. We got several who would comfortably fit on the right edge of the Republican Party. By the time we got done, they gave cover to a lot more people to sign on and to feel comfortable that this is solidly coming from the Republican side and is a solidly conservative message. We have felt for a long time like Utah is a potential linchpin for the country. We have some of the more supportive Republicans on climate. We feel like Utah is one of the more likely places from which to get Republican support, but none of our members of Congress are going to step out and take a risk like this unless they have backup from the state. So we have to show them uh, some influential support, specifically on the Republican side, if we want them to take any action at all. This was our effort right now to pull out all the stops, leverage all the relationships we have, and try to make something happen on fee and dividend. If you have a good news story you want to share on the show, email me, radio at citizensclimate.org. That's radio at citizensclimate.org. Thank you for joining me for episode 63 of Citizens Climate Radio. Here at Citizens Climate Education, we have a solution that will greatly reduce pollution, which leads to climate change. We believe that putting a price on carbon will make a huge difference, and we want to tell you more about it. Visit cclusa.org slash price on carbon. That's cclusa.org slash price on carbon. Citizens Climate Radio is written and produced by me, Peter Santoscano. Other technical support from Ricky Bradley and Brett Cease. Social media assistance from Ashley Hunt Monterano, Flannery Winchester, and Steve Volk. Moral support comes from Madeline Perra. The music on today's show comes from epidemicsound.com. If you are a fan of the Art House, we post a standalone version over at artistandclimatechange.org. That's artistandclimatechange.org. 
Visit citizensclimatelobby.org slash blog to see show notes and find links to our guests. Citizens Climate Radio is a project of Citizens Climate Education.